Hi everyone. So good evening. Um, metrics is not the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the design, right? So do we ever des measure design? It seems very subjective. But today we have Gaurav Mato with us to give a few perspective to this. Gaurav is a design leader and currently heads product design at Mitra. He helps build products that people love. In the past, he has designed SaaS products at Citrix. He co-founded Tribu Innovations, a design-led consultancy based in Mumbai and Singapore. He started his career working for Media Lab Asia that was set up in collaboration with MIT Media Lab. Gaurav is passionate about all aspects of design from graphic interaction, product design to architecture. It's my pleasure to introduce you, Gaurav. Um, but before we proceed, to just know, get to know our audience and get, to the, get into the grooves of design metrics, there is an interesting poll coming up. So I request all of you guys to take it up and help us understand what you think of the design metrics. So here's the question. Which of the following best describes your perception of design metrics? Perfect. Smita, thank you for the uh, introduction and the kind words. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, Smita, thank you for conducting that poll. I think it was a very interesting question that you had uh, as the first one. And it was also good to see the kind of uh, mixed response that the audience had. Uh, also good to know that we have product managers, business analysts, uh, designers in the audience today. Uh, so let me just get started. Uh, we'll cover some interesting things in this discussion. As Smita mentioned, uh, uh, the topic that I'll be covering today is uh, how do we measure design and uh, some metrics uh, that we can use to measure design. Um, yeah, um, let me just get started straight away. Uh, I still see the poll uh, up on that. Uh, I, I believe we've closed that. So, um, you know, as Smita mentioned, I've uh, designed experiences uh, over the course of my career for SaaS products, for enterprise products, and uh, consumer-facing e-commerce uh, applications as well. Um, some of the work that I've done has been um, on improving existing products. Uh, some of it has been on innovating and creating new products. Um, the, some of the applications and products uh, have had users across the globe. And uh, some of them have been focused on the enormous Indian market. And uh, these products have also been across platforms. So um, more recently, uh, with the e-commerce uh, platform, it's heavily dominated with the mobile apps, MWeb, um, website. Uh, in the past, I've also done some, uh, uh, worked on some desktop applications. And uh, today, I'll be sharing uh, insights that I've learned over the years uh, by working on these products and how experience could be measured uh, for different kinds of scenarios, for different kinds of products, right? Over this talk, I'll be using uh, certain terms interchangeably. Uh, so if I say users uh, and you, in your context, think of it as customers, uh, just feel free to you know, change that um, as I go. Uh, or you could be working on a product uh, that actually doesn't have paying customers. Uh, and I think their users would just hold good. So as Smita said, you know, can design truly be measured, right? This question keeps coming up whenever I discuss this topic with designers or other folks, uh, because there's a lot of subjectivity in design, right? So can we truly measure design um, and what aspects of design, right? Um, so I want to address this upfront and uh, the way at least I think of design is in two parts. So there is subjectivity in the design craft um, in the way we create things. So there are certain aspects of design which are very visual in nature. They are visceral uh, in nature. And uh, you see something uh, and you like it or you dislike it, right? Certain products evoke certain feelings in you. And uh, sometimes there is an emotional connect as well with products, right? And these, these tend to be um, extremely hard to measure, these kinds of qualities of design. Uh, whereas there are other aspects of design, right? Uh, which, uh, for example, design 
is all about problem solving and there is a lot of objectivity uh, that goes into problem solving can we measure some of these aspects uh, that we have in design right um, and uh, it's also about pro problem solving in an effective manner uh, i think smith one of the options that uh, smith had in the poll was about uh, design being like art and it just cannot be measured right i believe design is very unlike art there are certain aspects that we derive from art uh, that we use in the aesthetics uh, of the design uh, but i think design is all about problem solving it's not uh, about what you know i feel uh, like doing and i continue to do i don't care about the user or the business right design serves the users and uh, we can actually measure how well the problem has been solved um, and i think this this goes across uh, all fields of design right uh, it's just much easier to do this in the digital product design world that we are in today uh, but um, you could also for example measure certain aspects of industrial design uh, you could measure uh, how much material has been used how stable the form is uh, right uh, i studied architecture a long time ago and uh, even in architecture there are certain aspects that can be measured fairly easily for example what's the area utilization right uh, what's the circulation space for this building versus the usable space what's the energy consumption uh, sustainability aspects of the building right uh, how much parking does it cater to um, and then there are certain aspects that are very hard to measure right when it comes to the aesthetics the form of the uh, uh, building the spatial quality right the spaces that get created uh, when a building is created uh, those tend to be very hard to quantify um, you can have a opinion on them but uh, uh, it's very hard to put that in on a scale um, and uh, let's say i was an architect and i was designing a building and i wanted to uh, speak with the occupants or the visitors of that building i would probably have to wait for like 5 to 10 years for that to be constructed and then Uh, people occupying it people actually starting to live and breathe in that space uh, to be to be able to get some feedback but that's not the case with uh, digital product design right so that brings me to uh, the next thing which is all about user centric design and uh, i think i saw a mixed uh, uh, audience here a lot of product designers a lot of product managers uh, and i i don't have to really explain this term right uh, we always design uh, keeping the user needs uh, in the at the center right so it's all about problem solving for the users even when we are solving problems for business uh, we want to keep the user at the center of it we want to make sure that we deliver an excellent uh, experience to our users uh, and our users find value in the product right they continue to use the product and uh, we obviously want to build uh, habit forming products right at the end of the day every company strives to do that um and uh, therefore uh, what happens is that data of informed ux design becomes very critical um and i'm using this term very specifically data informed not data driven um uh, and when we talk about data there are various forms of data right there is qualitative data that a lot of designers are generally familiar with uh, or researchers are very familiar with this uh, format of data and then there are uh, certain quantitative aspects uh, as well right and the the reason we want to measure is because we want to benchmark our products first of all benchmark and then figure out where we want to go from here uh, which which parts do we want to improve further um, which parts do we want to tweak uh, bring more user attention there right and uh, the constant uh, uh, journey is all about you know how do we improve the exp experience through experimentation so um, we create certain hypotheses we test them Uh, and in the process we learn about the behavior of our users um uh, the the other point you know that comes uh, with ux design is that today the cost of making changes and cost of improvement in a product in the digital product world is uh, comparatively lower than some of the other fields of design right i spoke about architecture earlier and uh, imagine what would it cost to uh, uh, make significant changes uh, to a building right but uh, we constantly discuss uh, how certain products digital products have been now redesigned uh, completely redesigned right um and uh, uh, leave alone like smaller changes that go on in a in a digital product right a lot of users won't even recall these changes um and we'll discuss about the experimentation later in the talk um now let me shift gears and uh, show some 
realistic problems that we all encounter uh, when we work with uh, with with the uh, with a lot of stakeholders and look at business uh, overall right so let's say you are a product manager or a designer working on a saas productivity tool right and you would probably uh, you would have encountered this kind of a scenario where you want to grow the active users by x percent over the next quarter or you could be working on a food delivery app and you want to redesign your checkout flow and reduce drop offs or you could be working on a music streaming service and uh, you want to uh, get more people to listen to songs on your product right these are all goals that we kind of relate to but how do we go about achieving these right how do we break down uh, these kind of problems into smaller uh, projects and how do we measure our progress on these kind of projects especially the experience part of it now uh, the way i think of a uh, product matrix is broadly in these categories right um and you know th this list is not exhaustive by any means um some people might group it uh, under different heads uh, but at least i think of uh, matrix experience matrix in this fashion um so the first set is about loyalty and satisfaction and generally things like net promoter score uh, customer satisfaction scores etc fall in this bucket uh, the next one is all about usability matrix so these are things that we measure when we conduct usability tests um things like uh, uh, task success task completion time system usability score right the next bucket is all about how many users are currently using your product right and uh, what's the churn like how many people uh, stop using your product over a period of time how many people are you able to retain uh, what's the growth like uh, the next bucket is more around behavioral uh, matrix and this is about how frequently do people use your product right what's the engagement or what's the adoption for features what's the repeat usage like how do people navigate in your product right do they land on this page and where do they go next um uh, the 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 last bucket i feel is uh, i think uh, most people here would know of this you know it's conversion like uh, simple uh, click through rates um, and drop offs the funnels that we all are very familiar with yeah now i'll i'll quickly jump into each of these buckets and cover a few um uh, not in detail but at least give you a flavor of what what lies in these um the first one is about loyalty and satisfaction and net promoter score is a very well known um and and also highly debated metric uh, that a lot of companies use um and this actually measures loyalty on a 11 point scale right it's a very simple question that is asked to uh, users Uh, this is also you know most of these um, loyalty satisfaction matrix are self reported matrix so users themselves tell you right you conduct a survey and they tell you what they feel like so the question is how likely are you to recommend uh, product x to your family or friends and you can replace this x with your uh, product name or service name uh, people who rate uh, this survey with a 9 or a 10 are promoters and everyone who rates between 0 to 6 is a detractor um and 7 to 8 are kind of passives they are indifferent to uh, the experience right um and the way to calculate is you deduct uh, detractors from the percentage promoters and you get a nps score so theoretically your nps score could lie anywhere between minus 100 to plus 100 um and uh, an average uh, score is uh, considered to be like a 20 a good score is anywhere between 60 um good like really loyal brands have scores above 70 um now you could argue that you know hey this doesn't tell us anything about experience uh, this is all about loyalty but uh, there have been a lot of studies that actually relate loyalty to the experience that is delivered right? it's unlikely that you would recommend a service or a product to someone uh, you know uh, if you've not had a good experience with it right and uh, this this survey the nps survey generally also has another question which is an open text field right and uh, people uh, users are actually nudged to Uh, enter uh, any any feedback that they might have in that field and i think that's also a huge gold mine for designers to look at and derive insights from it's not just the nps score that uh, we need to look at and worry about right similarly there is a customer satisfaction score very similar kind of a question um, this is measured on a 5 point likert scale a 5 point likert scale is very often used in surveys and uh, it's again a very simple 
formula to calculate your customer satisfaction score. There is another similar score uh, that is called the customer effort score. And the question there is how easy was it to deal with, the, with our company today? And again, a five point Likert scale, extremely difficult to extremely easy. And uh, again, you can figure out uh, what kind of challenges uh, customers are facing with, with your product or service. Um, the next one actually is, I think uh, a lot of people are familiar with, we use this every day, right? When we uh, download a new product, um, which is app and play store ratings. Now, again, I think what's very critical here is uh, not just to look at the rating, but the reviews that come, right? The detailed feedback that people give uh, on the play store and app store. There is also a Microsoft uh, store. There is also an Apple uh, Mac store. And each of these have a very similar kind of a pattern, right? You can look at a product rating, you can look at reviews. Uh, again, a, a lot of uh, data can be derived of, out of this. Um, I'll move on to the next bucket. Uh, this is all about usability metrics, uh, how usable or easy to understand your product is. And uh, the first one, uh, you know, usability generally we relate it to qualitative data um, because that's what we gather uh, in a usability research. Uh, but there is also a lot of quantitative data that can uh, that can come out of a usability study. Uh, I'll show you some examples. Um, so, for example, the uh, really simple one is task success. Right? You could measure how many people were able to con to uh, complete a task successfully, right? And you could uh, just do a binary uh, rating for these, right? A one and a zero. Uh, so, for example, in this usability test, uh, uh, five tasks were tested and six across six users. Uh, and as you can see, you know, task three needs a lot, could, could uh, need a lot of improvement, right? So the score is not very high, the task completion rate, whereas task five seems to be fairly easy to understand and grasp. And most users uh, were able to complete that. Uh, I think what's again important here is not just looking at uh, the task success rate, but also looking at where are people stumbling, right? Where are they uh, encountering errors? Where are things not clear to them? and then work on them. Similarly, there is a task completion time. Um, again, very simple to understand, right? You measure how much time it takes to complete a task. I think for a lot of uh, B2B products, uh, a lot of products that need a uh, repetitive task, this is a very critical metric to look at and measure. Um, and um, generally a lower task completion time is better uh, for functional tasks, but you could also have products where you want uh, the time to be longer, right? For example, games fall in this bucket. Um, you want people to spend more time uh, uh, playing that game, right? So I think context becomes very critical and uh, what you're measuring also becomes uh, a factor of that. And the next one is uh, uh, system usability scale. Um, this is actually a survey that's done after the usability test is complete. So you've walked the user through a set of tasks, uh, they've performed them, and now you give this uh, uh, survey to them. Uh, it has 10 questions and uh, each of them has a five, is, uh, the user needs to rate on a five point uh, like that scale again, strongly disagree to strongly agree. Um, the way it's structured is that uh, the odd number questions here uh, are actually uh, in a positive format, whereas the uh, even ones are in a negative format, right? And there is a formula to calculate it. Um, so this measures actually two things. It measures the usability of the product as well as learnability of the product. Uh, because there are some questions that focus uh, essentially on learnability. How easy was it to figure out? Um, and uh, generally a score of anything uh, less than 50 is not acceptable on this. Uh, 68 is considered to be a very average score. So anything above 70 is actually what you should strive for in a system usability scheme. Um, I'll move on to user metrics. This is like the next bucket that we have. How many users use the product, right? And I think this becomes very critical uh, for consumer facing products uh, where uh, users, you want to acquire users, you want to look at how many users are currently using the product and how is that base shifting or changing, right? Um, now, the, uh, the, the first metric to look at is uh, essentially churn. Right. Um, and this is essentially how many, what percentage of users have stopped using your product in a given period of time. Churn is generally measured like in a weekly basis, generally on a monthly, quarterly basis, annual basis, etc. 
and uh, actually the formula the simplest formula for churn is really simple you just uh, look at how many people have stopped using your product and divided by the number of users you had at the beginning of this period right um, and then do like multiply it by 100 to get the churn percentage uh, but what makes it complex is uh, that you're also constantly acquiring new users right so even during if you're looking at a month uh, you're you've probably added like 500 new users on your product and out of those 500, maybe 100 have also left. And let's say you had a base of 10,000 to begin with. Now out of that 10,000 also, uh, some thousand have left, right? And then how do you calculate it? Uh, so that, that's where the complexity in the calculation comes. There are different ways of calculating it. I will not get into the details of it, um, but it's important to know um, how many people are currently leaving or stop uh, using your platform. It, retention is just the opposite of churn. So retention measures how many people continue to rout routinely use your product in a given period, right? So both are important to measure um, and you could have different strategies to increase or decrease both, right? Um, here's an interesting metric, um, right? So this is uh, actually a little dated data. This is from second half of 2018. Um, and I'll just read out the statement. This is the average three month user retention rate of mobile apps worldwide. Uh, stood at 29% with a 71% churn rate. What this means is that in a, in a period of three months, um, most of the mobile apps that are out there in the world, um, they saw an average retention of only 30%, 29%. Right? So 70% of the users uh, left or stopped using that product in a three month period. Right? And this is, uh, this is actually, um, uh, something to be concerned about if you're creating a mobile app, right? How do you retain users uh, over a long period of time? What kind of uh, things do you do in your design and experience that uh, brings them back? Right. The next set is uh, around behavioral metrics. And uh, this is about uh, how and how often do users use your product? Um, uh, I'm sure a lot of people here are familiar with like active users, sessions, right? So active users are measured um, uh, in on like a daily, weekly, monthly basis. I've just put a DAU there, but DAU stands for daily active users. You could have MAU, which is monthly active users. Similarly, you could measure sessions on a daily, weekly, monthly basis or sessions per user. Um, and um, a lot of companies, especially those in the social, um, um, social media kind of platforms, right? They measure engagement uh, with DAU over MAU kind of a metric. Um, so this is about frequency of usage. I don't think this applies to all kinds of products, um, uh, but it definitely applies to products where you want to create a lot of engagement. You want more people coming in and more frequently. Um, right. So the other ways of measuring engagement could be just looking at uh, content consumption. Right. So how much content is being consumed by uh, a user or uh, which specific features are being used by that user. For example, uh, share usage, right? Or uh, tapping on a media uh, that's embedded in a content or uh, visits to a profile or uh, likes, etc. right? Or following someone else, inviting other users, right? All of these kind of indicate how engaged uh, your user base is with your product. Similarly, there are like page views, time spent. Uh, you can get total page views, page views per user, page views per session, um, time spent uh, by user, right? So average session duration, et cetera. All kind of indicate uh, what kind of engagement you have. Um, right, the next bucket that we have is uh, conversion. And uh, uh, right, this is, again, I think this probably is the most uh, easiest to understand and probably uh, most of the people here would be familiar with this, uh, which is what do users click on? Where do they drop off? Right. And click through rate is like the simplest metric uh, uh, to measure this, um, which is how often is a button uh, or a link clicked. Um, you know, if you're in the world of ads, uh, CTRs is like the key metric uh, there. Um, right. Um, there are other metrics as well. Uh, we've covered page views, content consumed, errors, etc. Right. Drop-offs is another critical one uh, where you look at like a funnel, funnel view of uh, where people are dropping off. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know which product this belongs to. Uh, this is from Wikipedia. 
and this shows like a standard funnel that you have where um, from the home page the users are navigating to a sign up uh, product sign up page and uh, just between these two there is like a 89% drop off and then the sign up uh, is like a two three step process right and between the first page of sign up and the second page of sign up there is a again a 41% drop off right this indicates to users that uh, a lot can be done to improve this uh, these two areas specifically uh, we could look at uh, how do we increase the visibility of this whole flow um, right at the beginning right right at the top of the funnel um, and uh, we could also look at how do we uh, increase the first step itself right how do we make that easier to use so that more people proceed to the second step and eventually complete the funnel uh, funnels generally uh, you know as the name suggests generally go like this uh, you definitely see uh, drop offs uh, at every level so in this case the total uh, conversion is just 6% uh, from the total number of users who who start this process um right so i think we we've, we've looked at like most of the buckets um and uh, the idea was to just give you a flavor of uh, what these are and uh, what you could look at uh, uh, to measure experience right there are also interesting links between these so for example um if you're looking at uh, engagement right um you could you could also see that um, uh, there is a link between retention and loyalty and engagement for example right the more the more uh, loyal your customer base is the more people you'll be able to retain and uh, if you do the right things you'll also be able to engage them right um now you know at the beginning of this discussion we we said that there are certain things that that cannot be measured in design right and a lot of people uh, in the poll also suggested that it's it's pretty hard to measure certain things in design right it's uh, uh, it could probably in some ways be like uh, art so what are those kind of things right what what do they translate into um uh, i think some of them are uh, the, the things that you do for making the experience delightful um so these are for example these could be micro interactions uh, that you have in your product uh, some of the micro interactions actually help uh, relate users to certain elements on your uh, on your page or in your flow and some actually also help learnability but some could be just smoother transitions from one screen to the other that just add pure delight into the experience right typography the use of white space uh, tone of language some of these become slightly harder to measure but they do reflect in certain metrics so if you if you observe closely if you make changes to these um, and your for example uh, uh, you know sir sus score might go up um you would see uh, better results in on your usability metrics on the behavior metrics on engagement etc uh, but the delta generally tends to be fairly small uh, with these kind of changes and they become very hard to uh, quantify um let me let me move on to another aspect that we touched upon uh, fairly early on which is uh, experimentation right so uh, i think the way to look at uh, uh, things is that it's it's important to experiment and have a experimentation framework while you're designing and creating experiences so that you can constantly make changes and measure where you're going with these changes uh, each experiment should actually inform you something about the users right it should bring some insights to you uh, about your user base and how are they reacting to the changes you've made in the product how are they navigating now with the changes um, what do they like what do they not like are you seeing more drop offs or lesser drop offs now right uh, and ab testing is a great way to uh, to measure some of these and also to test a hypothesis right you need to you need to start with an hypothesis um, and figure out uh, which option works better um, i i'll give you one example uh, and uh, let's go back to some of the goals that we looked at you know early on so some of the business goals that we looked at uh, were let's let's take the first one which is saas productivity tool and uh, let's say the business goal was hey let's go active users by x percent over the next quarter right um now this could be a simple saas productivity tool that you have uh, how would you go about breaking this task right i think this seems like a very noble thought let's grow our user base let's grow active users 
how do you go about solving this kind of a problem how do you break it down into uh, smaller chunks so you could you could say that you know let's have let's build certain hypotheses around this um and uh, one of the hypotheses could be um let's reduce churn right if you reduce churn we'll have uh, more users and then we can engage them make them more active right and you could say that this we could do uh, through a improved sign up flow that we have and through an onboarding experience that we we'll create right so you could you could uh, draft your hypothesis in a way uh, where you say that you know we predict that by delivering a better sign up flow and onboarding experience new users will use our product more because they'll be able to understand the core value proposition better and we know this uh, is true if we observe increased retention with the product right so you're trying to frame that um, problem statement uh, by uh, calling out what the users will benefit out of this and how will that in turn affect uh, some of the experience metrics and the product metrics right um you could also have another hypothesis you could create a second hypothesis and say that uh, i'll increase sessions right i'll i'll um, change certain things that happen in a product that help me increase the sessions so you could say that we we give users some certain nudges so that they return to the product and perform some key actions and you could draft it as uh, we predict that by delivering relevant nudges more users will return to perform key actions because these nudges will now relate better to their journey and where they are in their journey right and we'll know this is true if we observe uh, increased engagement with the product right so what what could these two hypotheses now turn into uh, if you if you had to measure these right if you had to use some of these matrix that we looked at um, and uh, and put them against these hypotheses so you know i have taken a stab at it and uh, there is no right or wrong answer here right you could imagine this to be uh, in the context of your product or your service and and do a similar task so um you could say that we'll improve sign up flow and we'll measure uh, task success with it right how many people are able to uh, complete the sign up flow now uh, we saw an example uh, of the sign up flow funnel right um, and uh, can we create something similar can we look at how do we uh, reduce the drop offs at each level uh and increase the overall conversion you could say that we'll also improve it onboarding and we'll measure this with the sus score because we'll do some usability tests once we once we have some uh, mocks and prototypes and again look at uh, drop offs on this right um so the um drop offs is more like uh, just to make sure that people don't are not bothered with this onboarding and uh, they just don't drop off at that level right you could also say that you want to increase sessions and uh, how do you do how would you do that so we would uh, we would create some personalized actionable nudges and we measure sessions per user or uh, we'll also measure the overall happiness with the product and uh, look at nps for this right so you could do a similar activity with the kind of goals that you have uh, map some of these uh, uh, matrix uh, create hypotheses and uh, get on to some kinds of experiments um, yeah uh i just want to leave you with this uh, statement right um i i find this very interesting um it says most people use statistics or data like a drunk man uses a lamp post uh, more for support than illumination right so we don't want to do that we want to um, use data to guide our path right we want to develop insights uh, from data and from matrix uh, it's not for the sake of measurement that you want to get these matrix um right you want to use them so that then you can say that hey i'm here today i want to go here with this product how do i do that right um now um, i i think uh, you know throughout this this talk um, um i think there are certain metrics that i've not covered very specifically for example um, revenue as a metric right and i think a lot of product product managers uh, would be concerned with that Uh, but i think uh, for designers it's important to look at some of the uh, some of the more nuanced metrics uh, just rather than just look at revenue um, and uh, this could the revenue could also get affected by numerous other factors for example uh, if you look at uh, the you know the saas productivity tool as an example um, you could actually have a high churn uh, you could have the same kind of experience that you're delivering uh, today and you could continue with that 
Um, so you would end up with a declining user base. But if you increase uh, the price of your product, then the revenue goes up, right? It's got nothing to do with the experience. Um, similarly, I've not covered uh, other kinds of metrics like, uh, um, you know, things which look at performance of the product. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, the engineering world focuses on that. For example, um, crash rates, uh, bugs in a product, uh, stability of the product, et cetera. Um, and I think product managers, uh, as they are responsible and stakeholder or um, custodians of the entire product, they need to look at all of these metrics. But I think uh, designers need to focus on some of these and uh, look at how we can improve our experience through that. Yeah, so I think that's, uh, that's about uh, all that I had uh, in this discussion. Thank you, Gaurav. Um, so uh, we actually have a, a quite a few questions on LinkedIn post, but uh, in, in the interest of time, I would like to take at least one question, which I found really interesting. Um, this was uh, in, this is in the context of B2B. So the question is, how do we measure the UX effectiveness, the design effectiveness in B2B scenario? And uh, mm. if you could uh, throw some light on the uh, enterprise products. Yeah, yeah. So I think, uh, as I said, you know, there are some of these metrics uh, that uh, don't work very well for um, enterprise products, things like uh, uh, user base, right, engagement, etc. But there are others that work equally well for B2B and enterprise products. So for example, if I look at, uh, uh, if I look at uh, happiness or loyalty, right, all of them hold good for B2B products, you could, uh, you could still conduct a NPS survey with your users, with your end users, right? Not with your, uh, with the with the folks who are making a purchase decision, but with the end users of the product. And uh, uh, even if it's a captive audience, right? Even if a lot of B two B products tend to have captive audiences, uh, even then they'll be willing to tell you whether they like the product uh, or not, right? And uh, you'll be able to establish some kind of baseline. Uh, similarly, with the usability metrics, right? Uh, they hold true for all kinds of products, irrespective of whether it's a consumer facing product, whether it's a B2B kind of a B2C, B2B, uh, right? Whether it's a desktop product, whether it's an online product. Uh, I think usability metrics hold true in all kinds of scenarios. Um, you could also look at uh, uh, detailed funnels in your product, right? Where do you see most people dropping off? Um, and that could uh, inform you on, you know, which areas you need to dig deeper, probably do some usability studies around them, figure out why people are talking at that, and then uh, uh, take corrective action on that, right? Um, similarly, I think conversion, most of the conversion matrix also hold true here. Um, so I think apart from engagement and um, like overall user base, you could apply almost everything to B2B products. Yeah. And, and all B2B businesses also have goals, right? So you would, I'm sure you would have, uh, or you would uh, encounter certain kinds of business goals. And then it's up to you on how do you map uh, experience design goals to those. Mm -hmm. I think there's only uh, one other difference would be that uh, you don't have a choice, so much choice as a um, as an employee in a, in a company where you're actually given that tool, right? So you're supposed to use it. So maybe the task is, is the task completion, uh, the task uh, completion. most important task completion, uh, time for task uh, completion, mm -hmm. right? all of those become uh, fairly critical on with B2B products, uh, including NPS, right? Even if I'm forced a tool, um, right? Uh, I, I, I as a user would be willing to give feedback on uh, what's, you know, how do I feel about using that product? Would I recommend it to another company or not? Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you, Murli Gururajan, for that uh, question. It was a nice question. Um, and one more interesting question was, um, so we have been seeing so many metrics, right? Uh, the question is, do you think these goals are interrelated to the product design metrics? So how are these actually interrelated? Uh, I didn't catch what's the, uh, what, what are related? Uh, the uh, design metrics themselves, are they interrelated? Uh, I think, yes, so as I said, there are a lot of these metrics that uh, kind of uh, uh, are related. Uh, for example, um, if you have a high loyalty, uh, if you have a high NPS score, you're likely to see more retention, right? They kind of hint or indicate towards uh, the other kinds of metrics. 
uh, you would also probably see a high engagement uh, right so in a way they 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 are all at some level in, interrelated um, right the the lesser drop offs you have uh, the better conversion you will have um, yeah so yes i think uh, many many connections can be formed with these metrics okay perfect thank you so much for the answers and uh, it was a brilliant session so uh, there is this page that you're saying uh, there is a feedback poll on how we can actually make these sessions better so i request you all to take them and uh, help us uh, to make these sessions better and effective um and uh, i would like to thank you uh, gaura for the brilliant session um i think the audience loved it it was very engaging as a special uh, token of appreciation from all of us at uh, product leadership festival 2020 hosted by uh, institute of product leadership here's a virtual badge uh, for you the qr code uh, takes you to your own dedicated hall of fame page on the institute's web page once again i would like to thank you it was a great session thank you for connecting with you